Matthew chapter 28, if you're able to, as you stand and we'll read just one verse, we'll pray, and uh, we'll get on with this message. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 6, it says, He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we can gather together. I do thank you for your people, and I pray for the attentiveness of their heart and their ears and their minds to be focused on what God would have them here today. I pray that if there's a lost soul out there who does not know Christ, that today would be the day of their salvation. And we do thank you that we can come gathered here, uh, still in a free country, Lord, with the tumult and, and many things going on. Lord, help us to remove that from our minds and be focused on the resurrection of Jesus Christ this morning and celebrate that he is risen and he is alive forevermore. Lord, we do thank you for that. We thank you for your son who died on the cross for our sins and paid our price through his, with his precious blood. Lord, I do ask that you help me preach this message. Help me to say everything you would have me to say and lay it all out on the table. Lord, I pray that you would, you would uh, withhold from me anything that you would not have me to say. Fill me with thy spirit, dear Lord. Empower me this morning and give grace unto the hearers. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. He is risen, amen? And today we celebrate the resurrection of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want to invite you uh, to view the great three pillars of Christianity. Uh, God has given us an opportunity today to look and to see the events of history through the Bible, God's Word, where we can see the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So number one, I want you to notice... Uh, God wants us to see, come see the cross. Matthew chapter 27, and we'll pick up in verse 21. We'll read a little bit of lengthy, maybe a few verses here and there, and I'll try to give some type of narrative. Uh, verse 21 said, The governor uh, answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do with Jesus? which is called Christ. They say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Prior to this time, uh, Jesus would tell his disciples over and over again, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of sinners and is going to be buried and rise again the third day. Uh, we know that prior to this, Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, Father, if, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And when Judas came and with uh, that band of soldiers and some people from uh, the priests and the elders came uh, to go put him to death and arrest him, Judas betrayed him uh, with a kiss. Uh, and they're, they're asking for him. Uh, they arrest him and the disciples flee. Uh, from Jesus. Jesus is then brought into the hall of judgment, uh, a, a, a mock trial, and then they bring him now to Pontius Pilate, uh, or the Romans uh, governing over uh, uh, Palestine at this time. And, and, and now he says, hey, there's a custom that I release unto you, uh, a, 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 a prisoner. Who do you want me to release? Barabbas, a man who is uh, uh, full of seditions and murders and thefts, or Jesus, who's innocent? And they said, give us Barabbas. And the chief uh, priests and the elders caused the people to say, give us Barabbas. And he says, I am innocent, verse 24, of the blood of this just person, see ye to it. Uh, then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and on our children. Who would, just stop for a second, who in the world would answer that way? Who in the world would answer that way? Uh, this is only an account that can be known of us through history that God records for us here we would never have known that they said that had God not written it in his holy word, uh, which is important, but we'll maybe discuss that later on. So they released Barabbas, this man who was not innocent, but gave him uh, 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 freedom again and kept Christ uh, to be crucified. And when they had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. That scourging was with a cat of nine tails that would eat uh, little pieces of glass and bone and uh, metal that would rip, uh, dig into the flesh and rip out every every lash that would happen on our Lord's back. And so he was scourged uh, with 39 lashes. And then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus, verse 27, into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. They stripped him 
And they put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head. Not nicely, but jamming down. And a reed in his hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him, put his own raiment back on, and led him away to crucify him. In verse 33, And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. That gall and vinegar was to dull the senses of an alcoholic content. Look what Jesus did here. He tasted it up. He said, no, I would not drink that. He wanted to take upon him the full wrath of God and bear our sins in his body on the tree. Uh, verse 34, uh, I'm sorry, verse 35, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that I might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And this crucifixion was a type of uh, Roman meant for criminals who Jesus innocent took uh, this punishment for us. Uh, was driven nails in his hands and in his feet. And now below him, the soldiers parting his garments, with garments, which was also a prophecy fulfilled there. So sitting down, they look up at Jesus and they're watching him there. And set up over his head the accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were the two thieves uh, that were crucified with him, one on the right hand and one on the left hand. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, huh? Save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Verse 41, Likewise also, notice the religious rulers, the chief priests mocking him with the scribes who knew the law and the elders of the people. And said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. Just come down, Jesus, and we'll believe that you're the Christ. We'll believe that you're the Messiah, but he couldn't. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, verse 43, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. What a testimony from the mouth of unbelievers that he said, hey, he trusted in God. And I hope that's your testimony this morning, Christian, that you trust in God in these perilous times uh, that we're going through. We can have faith and confidence and trust in God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, crucified him and cast the same in his teeth. The, the, both of the ones on the side are, are, are saying along with the elders and the scribes and the Pharisees casting the same in his teeth. Yeah, if you're the Son of God, get us down from here. Prove yourself. Verse 45, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them stood there when they heard this. They said, This man calleth for Elias, and straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink and shoved it in his mouth. The rest said, Let us be. Let us see whether Elias will come and save him. Uh, when Jesus had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. Why would he say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus Christ took upon him the full wrath of God. And at that moment, the eternal Son uh, and, and the eternal Father had to turn his back because God cannot look upon sin, who his Son became for us. Uh, verse uh, 51, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves appeared unto many. Now, when the centurion, verse 54, and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake, and those things that were done, they feared greatly from the earthquake, from the same, from the, the, the temple veil being rent in two. And he said, truly, this was the Son of God. And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee and ministering unto him. So the cross, Jesus was put on display for the world to see the suffering of God the Son. Uh, to take upon him the sin of the world. First Peter 2, 24 would say, 
who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Uh, it was man who sinned against God. Uh, Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death pass upon all men, for that all have sinned. Uh, it was man who would have to pay the price for sin. Romans 5.19 says, For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And we know from Romans 6.23, the Bible says, For the wages of sin, the penalty for sin, the payment for sin is death. But not just any man. That man who paid the price was Jesus Christ. Uh, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And not only was he 100% man, but he was also 100% God incarnate in the flesh. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. Uh, in John 1.14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and and truth, born of the Virgin Mary, prophesied of the Old Testament, unto, for unto you a, 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 son, a child is born, unto you a son is given. Uh, he lived 33 and a half perfect years, not sinning one time. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, Jesus had to die on the cross for the sins of man, or for the sin of man. Who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe? Romans 5, 6 says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth his love, meaning he demonstrated it. How did he demonstrate his love? He demonstrated his love toward us in, in that uh, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hebrews 9, 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. 1 John 2, 2 says, And he is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The payment for our sin that was needed to appease the wrath of God was the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And it is only the blood of Jesus that covers us from the wrath of God. Amen? Number two, come see the tomb. God would have us to see the tomb this morning. Another pillar, a great pillar of Christianity. Uh, Matthew chapter 27 again, and we're going to pick up in verse 57. And when the even was come, Jesus already now had passed, given up the ghost. Uh, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door in the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Uh, in, the, in the other accounts of the Gospels, it says that they did embalm Jesus. They put spices and embalmed uh, uh, um, embalmment upon him. I don't want you to believe that. He was just wrapped and thrown in there. No, they, they gave him a proper burial. Uh, but nonetheless, Jesus... Uh, gave up the ghost. He said, it is finished. He gave it up to God. Uh, Christ was buried in a new tomb. Not his own. It was another man's. Why is that important? It was borrowed. It was important because it was only going to be needed for nothing more than three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Amen. Jesus prophesied of his own resurrection. Matthew 16, 21 says, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Uh, it was prophesied in the Old Testament in Psalm 16, 10, and 11, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy, and at that right hand are pleasures forevermore. His burial gives validity to his life. Go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I'm going to read it quickly. If you're not there, uh, try and catch up. John chapter 10, verse 17. Therefore doth my Father love me. Why? Because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. 
I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Amen? This commandment have I received of my Father. His burial gives validity uh, of his life, and his burial gives us assurance of a resurrection. If he never would have died, there would be no need of a resurrection. We would not preach, and the disciples would not preach, and the apostles would not preach, and all throughout the book of Acts, they would not preach the resurrection, but that was the primary power and the source of what they did preach from in their yeah. text is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So his burial, we see, and thirdly, come see where the Lord lay in Matthew chapter 28. We read this in Sunday school, but we'll read it again. And the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. And for fear of the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women that were there, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Uh, uh, it was an empty tomb. Jesus was not there. He had risen from the grave. Uh, they would continue to run and go tell the disciples. He'd say, come and see. Now go and tell the disciples. He goes into Galilee. Look at verse 9. And as they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. What does that tell me in you? All hail uh, is meaning, Jesus saying, Be cheerful! Be of good cheer! It is I! I am alive forevermore! Amen? The resurrected Christ is standing before him and says, Don't have fear! All hail! I am risen! The resurrection of Christ causes us to love him to fall down at his feet and to worship him, holding at his feet and worshiping him because he is the resurrected Savior. He has power over death. First, I want you to notice that Jesus rose personally from the dead. Verse 6, he is not here for he is risen. Secondly, Jesus rose bodily from the dead. In verse 9 again, and they that went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hail, and they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. If he didn't rise bodily, if it was some kind of spirit, how in the world would they wrap their arms around his feet and worship him if it wasn't a body that resurrected? Thirdly, Jesus rose visibly from the dead. We look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 10, Then Jesus said unto them, Be not afraid, go tell my brother, and they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. And then we see him again giving the great commission. Uh, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Go to Acts. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. You're listening just fine. You're doing really good. Acts chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse 3. Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. The resurrected Christ, continuing on, to whom also he, Jesus, showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining unto the kingdom of God. For forty days after his resurrection, he was seen, in a, he was seen by and appeared to many people. Multiple people, even people of upwards of 500 brethren at one time, Corinthians would tell us. Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave, and through his power he's resurrected because he is the Son of God. And we looked at it this morning in Romans 1, 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, just as he said he would. Mark 10, 34 says, And they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. Those are Jesus' words. Exactly what Jesus said is exactly what Jesus does. Exactly what God says is exactly what God will do. Amen. Bank on it. Put all your money on black, on God. He's going to give. He's going to bring to fruition what he says is going to come to pass. Amen. Amen. 
the tomb could no longer hold him. Death is strong, but life is stronger. Stronger than the dark, the light. Stronger than the wrong, the right. Faith and hope triumph that day with the rolling away of the stone and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's a tomb of Muhammad that's empty this morning in Medina somewhere in Saudi Arabia. There's a tomb of John Smith somewhere in Illinois that's, I don't know if anybody cares about that one. Uh, there's a tomb of Gandhi. There's a tomb of Buddha. But the, but the garden tomb of Jesus is known for one simple fact. And that fact, my friends, is that the tomb is empty this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ is not here as he said. He is alive. He is risen. He, Jesus would say in Revelation 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Amen. What religion, what prophet, what priest, what sheik can say that, that I am he that liveth and was dead, uh, but I am alive evermore. Only Jesus can say that. Amen. Only Jesus can. Amen. Jesus would say in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It sounds kind of exclusive. Sounds kind of, hey, hey, uh, you're the only one? No, 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 all roads kind of lead to heaven. We just call them different things. No, no, no. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the only way to heaven. I am the only way to everlasting life. So I ask this question. What does that mean for the Christian? There's a plethora of things, but I'm going to give you four this morning. Because of the resurrection, number one, we don't live for ourselves. We live for Jesus. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Why don't you turn there? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to look at a couple verses. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us uh, to, to be held together or to arrest the attention because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Should not live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. What does that tell the Christian? We don't live for ourselves. We live for Jesus. We live for Jesus. Somebody say amen. We live amen. for Jesus. Amen. And we submit to his authority in our lives by yielding to the Holy Spirit in us. Uh, and living out our faith in Christ by our good works. That may we glorify God in our bodies which are Christ. Which are God's. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify your uh, God in your body and your spirit, which are God. Secondly, what does this mean uh, for the Christian? Secondly, because of his resurrection, we have a real hope in Jesus. Go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. Thank you for being quick. Thank you for turning there. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a real hope in Jesus. Amen. It is not a false hope. It is a real no-so hope. We have a living hope, a hope that rests upon uh, the fact of his resurrection. Hope by what? Uh, by you know, a dead body in the grave. Hope by some person that stole the body doesn't know where he's at. No, no. Hope by the resurrection. We have hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And you notice back in verse 3, he says, um, uh, according, with according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us, begotten us, born again by the Spirit of God, uh, why? Be, begotten, being born again uh, unto a lively hope. That's not a dead hope. That's a living hope. A lively hope. Jesus Christ is he that is alive forevermore. Sitting on the right hand of the Father. Continuing to make intercession for the Christian. Amen? Amen. And always. Always. Uh, we don't seek the we don't seek the God among the dead. He's the God of the living. Amen. And because of His resurrection, we can have abundant and a lively, a real hope because of the fact of Jesus Christ 
resurrection. Man, y'all ain't happy this morning. I guess I'm the only one. That's why I couldn't sleep last night. Y'all like, how are you up here preaching? I have no idea. Uh, thirdly, we want we will be resurrected like Jesus. Why is it? What does the resurrection mean for the Christian? Because of his resurrection, we too also will be resurrected in a glorified body. Amen? This corruptible is going to put on incorruption. This mortality is going to put on immortality. And we're going to be like him and we're going to see him for as he is. Praise the Lord. Amen. You're not going to have a knee problem anymore. You're not going to have a back problem anymore. You're not going to have a thyroid problem anymore. You're not going to have a belly problem anymore. You're going to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be resurrected and be just like him. Praise the Lord for that. It means that we're not only to celebrate the resurrected Christ, but we're also to celebrate all those that are in Christ can be resurrected as well. And for the Christian, death is not the end. Death is the beginning. Amen. Amen. Death is the beginning. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Why does this matter to the Christian? Why is this important to the Christian? There's, there's many things, but there's just a few I want to share with you here. Uh, uh, not, not only uh, because we live for Jesus, because of his resurrection, we live for Jesus. Uh, and, and thirdly, because of his resurrection, we'll be resurrected and like Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Them of that slept, notice in back 20, the first fruits of them that slept. He was the first fruits of them that slept. Who are those? Those who are in him. That is to say, all of us who are in Christ will follow him, will be resurrected also. Titus 2, 3, we are looking for that blessed hope in the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is hope. In the resurrection, there is a lively, real hope in the resurrection. We stand here this morning and tell people, hey, there is a coming judgment that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And there is a time on this earth where God is going to call up and say, come on up, children, come on home. And there will be a rapture of the saints of God, those who are in Christ Jesus. And we warn people day after day after year after year and say, Christ is coming. Get right with God now. And only through his son can you have that righteousness. Amen. Amen. We know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, but fourthly, because of his resurrection, fourthly, we have a home in heaven prepared for us. Amen. Go to John chapter uh, 14. John chapter 14. We'll read here. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. That's a promise from the Word of God. It's a promise for the believer. We have a home in heaven prepared by Jesus Christ Himself. Amen. Uh, 1 Peter 1 4, we just left it uh, in the second or the fourth verse to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. We know that one day this earth will be burnt up. Everything that you have in this life will be burnt up. It's um, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, a man's life consisteth not of the, of the abundance of things that he possesses. possesses. Jesus would say it's all going to be burnt up one day. But one day when we die or here if we die or we're in the rapture that Jesus Christ takes us out. He says, look, we're going to a heavenly inheritance. A heavenly inheritance. That it says what? It's incorruptible. You can't, it can't be defiled. It's undefiled. It doesn't fade away like your clothes get faded. You have a black t-shirt or whatever, and you wash it so many times, it gets faded. You can wash the walls of heaven so many times, they're never going to fade away. Amen? We're going to have a home in heaven. Why? Because of the resurrection of Christ. Colossians 1.5, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before, and the word of the truth of the gospel. That's what it means for the Christian. And there's a lot more you can say about that. But what does this mean for the non-believer? Come to the Lord today. Come to the Lord today. The, invita the invitation is open to any who all who want to receive the free gift. Because Ephesians 2.8.9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, 
not of works, lest any man should boast. By trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, 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 Ephesians 1, 7 says, In whom we have redemption uh, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He redeems us. He redeems us. He buys us. A final transaction was paid once and for all, never to be repeated. Christ cried out on the cross, it is finished. His earthly ministry was done. It was complete. Nothing else had to be done. He did it all for you. We don't have to do anything in and of ourselves. You cannot lose this gift that Christ has because 1 Peter 1.5 says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And John 10.28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Aren't you glad this morning that you can never be plucked out of the Father's hand? I know I am. His blood was shed for you, it was shed for me, it was shed for the whole world, especially to them that believe. So many people get caught up with religion instead of a relationship. Salvation is not something we achieve. Salvation is something we receive. Uh, how can I receive salvation? Number one, you must admit that you are a sinner. You have to admit that. If you do not know you're lost, there is no reason for you to be saved. They call it salvation for a reason. Uh, you need to be saved from the wrath of God. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Secondly, you must realize that there is a price for sin. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, hell, and the lake of fire. That payment was paid by Jesus. Number three, believe that Jesus paid that price for you. We read the verse earlier in the message, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet believers, uh, I'm sorry, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection, the three pillars of Christianity. I believe that God died, that Jesus, God's son, died, that he was buried, and that he rose again. So third, fourthly, trust that eternal life is the only, is only through your belief in Jesus. That whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Only believing in Jesus Christ will get you into heaven. And then lastly, confess your beliefs through prayer and receive salvation. Romans 10, 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. 2 Peter 3, 9 says the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is longsuffering toward us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. John 3, 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the only begotten Son of God. Revelation 22, 17 says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life Freely. So I ask you this morning, will you come to the Lord today? Let's pray.